Hi guys. Today I've got 10 points in 10 minutes with Marcy Pusey. Yes, my name is Marcy Pusey and I am a trauma certified story coach um, and publishing consultant, mama, all the things. And I'm so excited to bring to you today 10 of my I, most inspiring life points or points that have impacted me. And I hope that they will inspire and encourage you today as well. Point one for me is that you would know that you are worthy of being valued, loved, and safe. I spent a lot of years maybe understanding that cognitively, but not really understanding it at a soul level. And that impacted my relationships, my sense of self, the confidence that I showed up into life with. And so I know it's not enough necessarily for you to hear from me that you are worthy of being valued and loved and safe. But if, if Stefan and I can be another voice on your journey, reinforcing or instilling that belief in you in any way, then I want to do that. You are worthy of being valued, of being loved and being safe. It doesn't matter where you've come from or what has happened to you or what you've done. You hold that intrinsic worth and value. And I want you to know that. And you're welcome to borrow my belief until you hold it for yourself. I know that that was something I did for years. People would speak that into me and I'd think, I don't know if I believe it, but I love that you do. And it gave me a kind of boost and um, yeah, boost on my own way to believing it for myself. And so feel free to borrow ours, but you are worthy of being valued, loved and safe. If you want to change your relationships, point two, recognize your own worth and value first. I spent a lot of time wanting to improve my relationships. I thought that I was the one to blame or I was the defective piece or if I could just figure out how to make someone happier, longer, better, then maybe everything would go well. And so actually my own journey to recognizing my, my own worth and value came from a search for how to make my relationships better. I'm so grateful that that led me to seeing myself but I wish I had known also early on, right away, that it was me that could actually change my relationships. So what I learned as a result of reaching out to a coach, a purpose and clarity coach, Gary Williams of Better Future International, was that I've been wired a unique way. I have a design and you have a design and you have a uniqueness and we're here on earth different for a reason because we have something to offer and together as community we bring a real beauty to the world and we enhance it it's it's true that we are stronger together i think of care bears i'm going to age myself but anyone from the 80s 90s maybe earlier care bears like they each had their own little symbol on their tummy and it gave them a unique piece of their personality or who they were or what they could offer and they could shine their little tummy light into the sky and be so beautiful on their own but when a really big obstacle would come their way a bad guy an antagonist of some kind they would band together and shine all their little tummy lights into the sky and it would create a force so big that together they could defeat the obstacle in front of them. And I see us kind of like that, but I didn't know. I didn't know that. I thought that I was supposed to look like everyone around me. And so a metaphor that I use is that I thought I was a hammer. And I've spent a lot of my life trying to hammer nails into the wall. And through this purpose and clarity conversation with Gary Williams, I actually learned that I'm designed to be a spoon. Okay, the metaphor eventually breaks down, but the point is, I've been a banged up spoon, but I learned that I wasn't supposed to be like everyone else around me. I was supposed to be me and the way that I had been made and designed. Once I began to realize that I was given or I developed a confidence and a growth in me that actually ended up changing all of the relationships that I was trying to work on, not because they changed, not because the circumstances changed, but because I finally understood that I had worth and value to bring. I didn't need that from the people around me anymore, which leads me to point three. Your value comes from you. I spent a lot of life believing that Everyone around me was holding up mirrors, reflecting to me my value and my worth. And I was always trying to get what was in that mirror to look better. Sometimes it was nice, but oftentimes it was something about not being enough or being too much. And I, and I just saw this broken reflection all the time. 
well, my same purpose and clarity coach taught me that there's, there are lots of windows in the world that get misidentified as mirrors. Those reflections were never intended to show me my worth or value. They were just slight little reflections of a window, which was actually an opportunity to peer through into the other person's experience and to look into their world and go, wow, this is a perception you hold in your world. It's really small. Cheers to you. And not own it as actually who I am and what that brings to me. So point three would be your value comes from you. And when people hold up, when, or what, when they hold things up to you and want you to think that it's a mirror, it's probably actually a window. And that can allow you to separate yourself a bit from the messages that the world is constantly flashing all around. And if someone tells you that it's a mirror, you don't have to believe them. Take a close, close look and decide if it's actually a mirror or if it's a window. Point four, perspective changes everything. I've already addressed some of that in the first three points, but in my second TEDx talk, I talk about how you are more than your traumatic experiences. And some of that understanding around trauma and unprocessed trauma and recovery all comes back to how our brains heard the message that was coming at us from the world. A traumatic event is only becomes trauma if our brain perceives the event as a threat to our survival and not just our physical survival, but our actual sense of belonging and our sense of identity in the world as well. And we miss that. We think it's just physical survival and then we're surprised when we feel like we've been traumatized, but it's really been an attack on our belonging or on our identity. And so when our brains, when we can begin to work on what we believe and our thought processes around the messages coming at us, when we can discern windows from mirrors, traumatic events are less likely to become unprocessed trauma in our bodies, in our minds, and in our souls. And so I encourage you to stop and consider when these messages are coming at you, you hear them in your head, you might hear them in the world, to challenge them and ask if they're actually true or not true. And then move on from there. Step five, I believe that every story matters. I know that's kind of trendy right now and it's it's a slogan being thrown around a lot. It's a hashtag in a number of places. Your story matters, but it really, really does. As someone who has studied the brain for a long time, I've been able to see now how story uniquely lights up the brain in such a way that nothing else does. Almost your whole brain engages when you receive story, but also when you give story. Now, a lot of people wonder, well, how do I know if I have a good story? What makes mine good? Where do I even start? Those are wonderful questions. I will just hear from me that you do have a story that matters. You have a story that can tell others they're not alone. If for nothing else, if you sharing that you've gone through hard things, maybe you're still going through, you haven't overcome it yet. You still have something of value to offer to the other person who's going through it too and feel so alone and so isolated. Knowing that our brains are so impacted by the stories we tell and the stories we receive leads me to believe that we have a huge responsibility with our stories, both to tell them well, to tell them at all, to tell them well, and then to be mindful of the stories that we let in. Um, this might be through our media. I personally know that if I sit and listen to the news for very long, I end up depressed in a spiral of hopelessness because I hate pain in the world and I wanna fix it and I can't. So I have to be a steward of the stories that I let in and then challenge my perceptions. What are mirrors and windows? I have to go back through all of my tips to be a healthy person who can actually contribute to the pain of those things in the world. So your story actually does a healing work in you when you tell it, and it does a healing work in others when they tell it. Just quickly before I move on, when I talk about trauma being an attack against your sense of identity and your belonging and your physical safety, your story has an opportunity to address that in the other person. When I say that you can tell them that they're not alone, that is speaking right to that sense of belonging and identity. So again, storytelling is not just for the people who've arrived or overcome every single thing or are now experts in anything. They're about people on a journey being willing to be vulnerable and brave to share their stories with the hope that someone else is also going to be impacted and if nothing else, know that they're not alone and there's someone on the journey with them. 
Step or point six, there is always hope. This is a firm belief of mine. Now, one thing I've learned is that we often confuse hope with expectation and we'll call our hope in a thing that we're expecting and then once it disappoints us, well, now we believe hope is not real or there isn't hope and we can easily settle into a space of hopelessness thinking, nope, what in front, what's in front of me is all there is. The reflections in the mirror are all that I will see, the end. But no, I don't believe that. I believe that as long as you are alive and you are breathing, there is always hope. Hope that tomorrow will be better, that, you'll, that your perception can be more accurate. Every step towards something more positive is, is a beautiful and important step. And we can minimize the celebrations that these things deserve because we're defining what success looks like. We're defining what growth looks like. We're only looking at our failures and setbacks and not looking at the progress. So I believe there is always, always hope. And for me personally, from a faith perspective, I hold a faith in God. And so I'm able to put my hope in something even bigger than what I can see. And I would encourage you to look at that too. Is there something in your life where you can place your hope that is bigger in the things that you can see, in the people that you can see? Because things and people do disappoint. And it's so easy to confuse the two, to confuse this expectation in something that, that I just said it shouldn't be an expectation, but it is. A hope is a kind of expectation that believes in something good versus, okay, if I just get the right lawyer, then all of my problems will be solved. That's not the kind of expectation. Um, so point six, there is always hope. Point seven, as a therapist, this matters a lot to me to bring it up. Not all therapy is equal. I've talked a little bit about story. I've talked a little bit about trauma and trauma recovery. And some of the things I've learned about the brain is that we have consistently been mistreating trauma. We try to address it through traditional talk therapy. The problem is that unprocessed trauma is not stored in the part of our brain that does talk therapy. It's actually stored in the part of our brain that is very sensory. It, it gets stuck in our brain stem and that's where our automatic functions happen, walking, sleeping, eating. So if you are pursuing some kind of therapeutic help, know that not all therapy is the same and look for someone who is trauma certified, trauma informed, trauma studied in some way and who does sensory work. If you're not ready to go see a person for that therapeutic support and you wanna do what you can on your own, that's still why I talk about story, but you can also do it through art, through music, through body movement, dance, anything that allows your body to express itself uncensored provides now an outlet and an opportunity for this unprocessed trauma to get dislodged and begin to be filed correctly in your brain. And so play around with that and don't, don't go into therapy like for 10 years wondering why you've been talking about your issues or your problems and nothing's changing. That could be an indicator that you need to do some sensory work. Point eight, and this comes directly from Brene Brown. She's been such a huge impact in my own life, but boundaries are loving. Boundaries are loving. I spent much of my life believing that if I held up a boundary, I was gonna disappoint someone. I was gonna make them angry, whatever. The, they weren't going to like it. And therefore, because I thought it was a mirror, they were not going to like me and my worth diminished. But boundaries are such a sign of health. And maybe that's a trigger word for you. Maybe limitations or putting limits on things is better. If you need new language to help you have a healthy fence, not wall, fence around your playground so that you get to decide who comes on and plays on your playground and who does not get to come on and play in your playground, then use the words that you need. But do recognize that it is so kind, so kind for yourself to, to uphold those limits for your health, for your safety, and for the good of others. The point that Brene makes that really impacted me was that if we just lay down the fences and live life free willy, um, we end up living quite resentful and frustrated and tired and discouraged. And we can't show up to any of our yeses as our best selves if we have not put some restrictions on that and on what's healthy for us. And that made that was so eye-opening to me. Oh, I cannot have boundaries, but then I'm kind of a mean, angry person, even if it's just inside and impacting me and eating up my soul. So I want you to know that whatever your journey is, 
it's okay and it's so good to have healthy boundaries. Go look at Brene Brown. She's got a five minute talk on it. It's so good. You could listen to it every day, but definitely do the work of taking care of yourself so that you can show up to the yeses in your life as your the best possible version of yourself. Which leads to point nine. I love to talk about the best yeses and the necessary noes. Those come through a level of vision and focus. With my same close, uh, my same coach, Gary, Purpose and Clarity Coach, I, I hired him to do a purpose statement with me. And so he spent some time with me listening, asking deep probing questions. And at the end of our time together, he presented the possibility of a purpose statement for me. He actually nailed it. So I didn't have to change anything he said. He was such a good listener. But that gave me a focus for my life and for the yeses that I would say yes to and the necessary no's that I would say no to. I find that a lot of us go through life a bit aimless, wandering, full of monotony and, and questioning, like, what is the meaning of my time here and am I doing it? And again, if we think about our survival brain, it needs to know that we have a place of belonging, that we have some connection to identity, and again, that we're also physically safe. And having a sense of your purpose, having a vision for your life, reinforces again that your identity and who you are as a human contributes to the world in some way. And that is a deep life internal piece of knowledge that we need, that we can add some value to the world around us. It's a basic, basic need beyond you know food and shelter and that kind of thing, to know that we are valuable humans that can contribute to the world in a positive way. And you can. So my encouragement with this point nine is to sit down with someone like Gary or with yourself and, and ask yourself, what is my purpose? What is my vision? The result of my time was that my purpose is to create safe spaces and connections so that others feel worthy of value and love. That line, that statement is hung up places. And when I get emails, when I get requests, when I get yeah, all the requests, I can filter it through that. Is this an opportunity for me to create a safe space or a connection so that people can feel worthy of value and love? And that makes my necessary no's feel less painful when there's some FOMO because I know that I have a clear laser focus on what I want to do with the time that I'm given here on earth. So point nine, know your vision, know your focus and your purpose so that you can, in a healthy way, have those necessary no's and those really important best yeses. And finally, point 10. I have a saying hung on my wall by Nelson Mandela. He says, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. And that's what I would want to leave you with as well. If you're on a journey of any kind, recovery, trauma, recovery, all the recoveries, addiction recovery, whatever it might be, as you're on a journey towards health, it is so easy to fall into making decisions based on our fears. Oh no, I'm going to fall back into it again. Oh no, I'm going to end up in the same place I was before. Oh no, I'm going to end up like my mom or dad or whatever it might be. I'm going to end up on the street out of money. Fear is so overwhelming and it's debilitating and it causes us to run, to hide or to freeze. And neither of those things, neither, none of those things actually support our ultimate health and goals. Um, they keep us alive if a bus is coming at us or a dinosaur is coming at us, but they don't help us to move forward in life in a healthy way. So, so may your decisions reflect your hopes and not your fears. That becomes another filter for me when I'm confronted with an opportunity to make a decision. I, I check in. Is there a fear here that's trying to steer my decision? If so, what is it? Is it wisdom or is it fear? Sometimes wisdom is checking in and they can feel a little similar. So check in and ask, is this fear of failure, fear of success, fear of something else? Well, then what would a choice that looks like hope look like? And where could that possibly take you? And then my encouragement with this final point is that you would choose hope. So this is Marcy Pusey and these were my 10 points for you today. Thank you. Marcy Pusey, 10 points in a little bit more than 10 minutes, but they are absolutely superb. So therefore, I just let you roll with all these, this fountain of wisdom. Marcy, thank you so much. And you guys out there, look after yourself. Bye.
Bye.